Despite what you see on my YouTube channel, almost everything I do here is meant in one way or another to support the operator in the field. This video is no different. Now, hopefully by now you've already seen my solar-powered GO kit for ham radio and you've already read my MAM portable off-grid power for ham radio series on my blog. If you have, well done. If you haven't, you probably want to read and watch those before you watch this video. For the rest of us, it's battery building time. In this first video, it's a 10 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery pack. We'll follow that up with a power film solar panel video. Then we'll finish up with a final video of a 2.5 amp hour mini lithium iron phosphate battery pack for your QRP radios. All right, let's get started. You are listening to the emergency broadcast systems. This station broadcasts emergency news and official information on the air for a sign area. Now, almost a year ago, we kicked off this whole battery building bonanza with the QRP battery pack. That was a lithium ion battery pack and the prototype for all the other packs to follow. Now, if I had any disappointments with that battery pack at all, it would have been with the housing. But perhaps we shouldn't knock it too much because it has lasted a year out in the field. These two new battery projects take everything we've learned from the QRP battery pack and steps up the game. The 10 amp hour version allows me to power up more devices for longer periods of time while actually carrying less weight. Also, being a modular pack, I can decrease or increase the pack's capacity depending on the type of comms that I want to achieve in that day. But before we go any further, let me give you five reasons why you might want to build this battery project yourself. Number one on my list was saving money. It didn't take me very long to figure out I could build a better battery pack with better features and options using better components than what was commercially available if I did it myself. Definitely nothing wrong with those packs, but in the spirit of amateur radio, I wanted to build mine myself and do it while saving as much money as possible. Next, I wanted to save weight. Traditional AGM or slab type batteries are nice if you're deploying from a car, a truck, a snowmobile, but I'm on skis or walking or on a bicycle. So in that regard, lithium or lithium iron phosphate was the only option for me. Number three was all about having the size, shape and capacity flexibility over the normally one size fits all slab. Number four, as a weak signal operator, I wanted to ensure that the components I used were definitely RF quiet. There's nothing worse than trying to work another QRP station and your own station is preventing you from doing so with the noise that it makes itself. Number five was all about building my own solution and making the component choices myself. This was definitely related to number one on my list, which is saving money, but I wanted to save money in the right way by using the correct components when building my own battery pack. Allowing someone else to make those choices for you, they might put profit over quality in their component decisions. Now, I know I said five things, but I'm going to throw one more in there for a bonus. At the end of the day, building this battery pack gives you the opportunity to learn something new. Internally, the original QRP battery pack looked horrific because it was actually a prototype. Uh, given the opportunity to build it again, I would definitely design and 3D print the housing and mounting points for the internal components. But let's take a quick look at those original components. So the original QRP battery pack used four 18650 lithium ion cells, two 18650 battery trays, a 10 amp BMS, a 12 volt UBEC voltage regulator, uh, the assorted wires, switches, connectors, and so on and an improvised housing. These new battery pack builds are much simpler. Let's take a quick look at all the components that go into the 10 amp hour version. The heart of this battery pack are the Headway 38120S lithium iron phosphate cells. 
Although each cell is about the size of a Red Bull can, you do get 10 amp hours out of each cell. It also gives us additional capacity without putting more cells in parallel. To take strain off of the cell housing when they're mounted, we use these modular 38120 battery trays. These trays simplify series or series parallel configurations with these cells and provide the right amount of spacing between each cell to keep them cool. Since these headway cells are using screws on the end of the cells to attach our wires, we're actually going to use ring connectors to attach the wires to the BMS, which means no cell soldering required. Now we arrive at the BMS or battery management system. The battery management system is probably the most important part of your battery build. It's the component that manages the balance or the voltage level of each individual cell. It provides overcharge or under voltage protection for the entire battery pack. And it provides short circuit protection for any mishaps. Now the most often asked question I get about the BMS is how do I choose the right BMS for my setup. And that's actually pretty easy. First, you need to measure the amp draw on your radio during transmit plus every other device you have connected to this battery pack. That'll give you the current draw in worst case scenario. Now as a QRP operator, I've chosen a BMS which has a max current draw of 10 amps. That gives me enough power to run a QRP radio like the 817 or Elecraft KX2. And it also allows me to run my tablet, laptop or some LED lights for the TP tent. Now if I wanted to run a QRO radio or I had a current draw higher than 10 amps, I would use one of these other BMS options. The BMS at the top is a 16 amp version of the first one I showed you, while the second one at the bottom is a 40 amp version. I'll leave links and examples to all three of these in the episode notes. Now that brings us to the charge controller. You might also notice that I'm showing it along with the BMS. Creating a marriage between the BMS and the solar charge controller turn this battery pack into a portable power system. Now you understand why I've taken you through seven minutes of this video before we even start building the pack. This isn't a battery pack. It is a portable power system. Oscar Hotel 8 Sierra Tango November Stroke Papa. Again? So the point of this battery project and most of the field work that I've shared with you during the summer of 2017 has all been designed to show you how it's possible to have a MAM portable off-grid power which integrates with fuel radio rather than the commercial options now that don't take into consideration how we work in the field. All right, it's time to warm up that soldering iron. So let's go ahead and start to build the battery. We're going to start that process by putting together the battery trays. Now there's a couple of different ways we can do that. Either inline or two by two. I'm going to set mine up for inline. And depending on which way you want to set up your battery trays, you just line up the slots and press them in place. When you're done, they'll look like this. Now we're going to start slotting each cell into the battery tray. Hopefully you're not colorblind because the only markings on the cell to determine positive or negative sides are the white or black bands on each end of the cell. Insert your cells into the battery tray alternating positive, negative, positive, negative until you're done. Make sure to push them in as deeply as possible so that they're seated correctly in each tray. When you're done, slide on the other end of the battery tray and push the sides together. Your battery pack will look something like this. 
Don't forget to check cell polarity, guys. If you're unsure, use a multimeter. Now we're going to wire up the BMS. I like to start by tinning up the pads, so we'll start there. Now we don't need a whole lot of solder on the pads, just enough to make sure we get a good adhesion when we are attaching the wires. Now flip it around and let's do the other side. Outstanding. Now we can start to prepare the wiring loom. We need to prepare five wires for the battery side of the BMS and two wires for the charge controller side. Each of those wires has a connector on one end and bare cable that's tinned on the other. I'll strip and prepare the bare wire end first and then I'll install the ring connectors. For the BMS side, I follow simple logic. Uh, red wire for the positive side, black wire for the negative side, and yellow for the balance leads. I'm kind of a nut about redundancy, so we're gonna crimp and solder these ring connectors. When I'm happy with those, I'll finish them off with heat shrink tubing. And we just keep working away at them until all of our wires are done. By the way, make your wires a little bit longer than you think you need. You can always trim them again when attaching them to the BMS. So let's start attaching some wires. A funny thing about attaching these wires, much of the feedback I get from viewers would lead me to believe that this part of the build is what freaks them out about building their own battery packs themselves. But seriously guys, all we're doing is attaching wires to a circuit board. That's something all of us have done from time to time in the past. Forget about it being a BMS or a battery pack and just attach one wire at a time. I purposely kept the segment short because it isn't really a big deal. One wire at a time. So now we're going to prepare the BMS and the wires uh, for our shrink wrapping. Now the battery side of the BMS is marked with uh, battery plus, battery three, battery two, battery one, and battery minus. We're going to mark the balance leads to correspond with those marks on the BMS board. This way, after we shrink wrap the BMS and bundle the wires, we know which of these cables corresponds to the port on the BMS. Step I forgot to show you when we were attaching the wires to the BMS. Now you don't have to do this, but I've gone ahead and included two jumper wires for the reset switch. I'll put a link to last year's video showing the point of this reset switch and why you might want to use it. If you have any questions about that, just leave them in the comments and I'll come back to it. Now we're going to apply the PVC heat shrink sleeve. The sleeve is going to protect our BMS and all of our hard work from any knocks, bumps or mishaps. I folded one end over so that I can insert the BMS into a kind of a pocket. The best way to shrink the heat shrink sleeve is to use a hot air gun. Please don't try to dry your hair with this hot air gun. We'll continue to apply heat uniformly to the sleeve until it shrinks around the BMS. Don't forget to flip it over, hitting both sides and the edges and corners. 
Now, believe it or not, I've actually never owned a heat gun. I purchased this one for these projects that we're doing this month, and uh, I'm still getting used to it. If you don't have one in your toolbox, I would have to say this is an excellent tool to keep around. I just wish I could have found one that runs on DC power from the shack. So the BMS is all ready. Now we can start wiring up the battery pack. So I'll start by removing the screws on each cell. I'll replace the screws using the jumper bar between the plus and minus ports on each cell. Although I have four of the jumper bars here, we only use three of them. Just a note, when you're replacing the screws, you need to remove one of the washers so that the ring terminal can fit in its place. For now, this is just a mock-up. We're not going to tighten it up entirely. We're just going to put them where they belong on the pack. We're going to install the bus bars between battery 1 and 2, another between battery 2 and 3, and the last one between battery 3 and 4. This will leave the plus and minus of the pack free for connecting to the BMS. So let's go ahead and insert our screws, but just put them in hand tight for now. So now you see with those bus bars installed, it makes one complete pack rather than four individual cells. We'll go ahead and install the last bus bar for battery 3 and 4. Once you have the last bus bar in, it'll be a good time to check each individual cell's voltage as well as the voltage for the entire pack. We can also think about the screws we're going to use to attach the uh, balance leads and the plus and minus for the battery pack. But with everything done, it looks like it's time to go ahead and install the BMS leads. Just one quick important note. The video in the upper right corner shows me putting tape over the ring connectors. I'm doing this so that the ring connectors won't short out on something or each other. So please cover all the ring connectors until you're ready to install the one you're working on. So I'm starting with the positive terminal of the pack. Next, I'll install the balance lead between battery 4 and battery 3. Battery 4 is the battery with the positive terminal for your pack. Place balance lead number 3 on the bus bar between battery 4 and battery 3. Since we're already working on this side of the pack, we can go ahead and install balance lead number 1. When we're done on this one, we'll flip the pack over and install balance lead number two. And as you can see, it's actually starting to look like a pretty cool battery pack. We'll straighten up these wires a little bit and then uh, tighten up all the other screws before inserting the uh, negative lead for the pack. Just a note about tightening down the screws. It's very possible to damage the cells by over tightening the screws. I'll put a link to the technical specs for the cells in the episode notes. There you'll find the torque specs for the screws. So you don't want to go all hulk on these screws because you'll damage your cells. So 
So after you're done tightening down all the screws and tidying up all the wires, you'll have two wires left over that aren't connected to anything. Those are the two wires we're going to install our momentary switch onto. I didn't receive my momentary switches in time for this video, so I'm going to leave these um, wires disconnected and open until I receive the momentary switch. If you want to see how the switch is installed and how it works, I have put a link to the original video for the reset switch in the episode notes. You'll find that in the description. So once we're happy with all of the zoom cables and uh, tidying up, there's one thing we have to do before the battery will actually operate, and that's touching those two yellow wires together. I've called it a reset switch in this video, but actually it's also the initialization switch. So if you're not getting power when you measure now, you'll know why. So now it's time for the bench test. We're going to test each individual cell and then we're going to test the pack as a whole. After we're happy with cell voltage and total pack voltage, We'll switch over from the fluke and put the inline voltage meter to see if the power pole connection is working on the other side of the BMS. So it looks like the battery's happy and the fluke is happy, so that's all good. Now we can connect the inline meter. And if the BMS isn't working or isn't initialized, we won't get any voltage on the meter. But the voltage is good, that means the BMS is working. Now we'll connect the charge controller. If everything is functioning correctly, we'll get the green heartbeat on the display of the charge controller. So we get our heartbeat almost immediately. We're gonna see if it's going to blink a few more times so that we can be sure. After that, we're going to connect the inline meter on the load port of the charge controller. If all the stars and planets are in the right order and in the right place, our inline meter should also light up and give us some voltage. Huh, and it does. Outstanding. So, each cell is working. The total battery pack is working, giving out the right voltage. The charge controller is working. Load port is working. So let's go ahead and put the battery pack into some sort of enclosure. Ultimately, I hope to 3D print the enclosure. At the moment, I don't have a 3D printer, and I haven't developed the skills to design the enclosure myself. If you want to help with that, certainly let me know. But for now, we're going to use Tupperware. All we're doing with this plastic case is giving the battery pack some knock protection. The battery trays or holders themselves actually provide the rigidity for the pack. So we use the plastic tray to absorb any energy from a projectile which might puncture one of the cells. In fact, if I could find a vinyl heat shrink sleeve, if that's large enough, I would just a PVC heat shrink the entire battery pack with the charge controller outside of it, then put it inside this admin pouch. And for my gung-ho friends, the admin pouch is just a, a Condor full-size admin pouch. All right, I know you guys are laughing, but look, it's protected and it looks cool. So, hmm.
Hey, practical note here. If you're wondering why I used a power pole connector between the charge controller and the battery pack, it's because sometimes I might want to use the battery pack straight to a radio without the charge controller. So now you're about to see my first fail in this battery build. And I'm reminded of the value of module testing at each step of the build. This video is already long enough, so I'll just tell you what happened. I did a crap job on one of the connectors going into the battery port of the charge controller. I made up a new set of cables and everything worked out fine. So I've repaired and replaced that cable, and now we'll start our test again. Alright, we have power coming out of the battery pack. Now we can also retest the charge controller. Outstanding. Now we have a heartbeat. Now we can go ahead and try the load port once more. Rock and roll. We have power on the load port, so I think we can go ahead and button it all up and uh, call it a day. I'm a little paranoid now, but uh, I think we're going to check just one more time. By the way, if you're wondering why I'm so rough with everything, it's because if I build something, I don't want to have to be gentle with it. When I take it out in the field, I don't have the luxury of being gentle with it. So, I treat it like I own it. Alright guys, there's our voltage. We are 100% good to go. So now that you've seen the whole thing go together, you probably understand better how simple the battery design actually is. We've got two wires coming out of a black box. When you're in the field, one of those wires goes to your solar panel. If you're in the shack, that goes to your power supply. The other one goes to your power distribution unit or straight to your radio. In the next video of the series, we're going to take all of this gear out to the field and test it with the Powerfilm F15-1200 solar panel. You've seen it already during the summer of 2017, but I want to show you again how everything works in the field. Don't forget to check oh8stn.org for the episode notes. Link is in the description. Also, if you have a question about something I didn't cover in the video, Ask me in the comments and I'll cover it in the episode notes. And that brings us to the end of the video. If you like what I'm doing, if you like the content that I'm creating, please give me a thumbs up and share this video with someone or someplace who might find it interesting. As always guys, rock and roll and thanks for watching.